Hi, I'm John Heaven from Compress in Hamburg, and I just did an interview with Kathy Faze from Chicago in the US, who is also a part-time employee of Compress, and I just wanted to ask her what she does, who she is, how she got involved in Drupal, and a few more questions. So here we go. It's uh, just after two o'clock in the morning over in Chicago, where Kathy is, and it's eight o'clock in the morning where I am, so I'm not looking at my best. Um, <laughs> so I'll quickly get to the questions so that when Cathy starts talking, we'll see her instead of seeing me. Um, so Cathy, if you could just start off by introducing yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Cathy, and um, I'm a volunteer for Drupal. Uh, I also work for Compress. And uh, for them, I uh, they have me do community work and um, some uh, blog posts. Okay, so when did you first start getting uh, getting involved in Drupal? Uh, first uh, was seven years ago, and uh, it was because I was involved with a nonprofit organization that didn't have a website and at that time I was uh, involved in technology but not building websites for my job but I thought hey I can build a website and I needed to find a tool to do it uh, because I knew I didn't want to do it by hand and I really wanted to use open source and that limited the field down there were three choices I think at that time I was looking at and uh, I picked Drupal, I think, um, because it looked to have a lot of support for it in terms of community forums and things. And, uh, and then for several years I was involved in that capacity. So I was a site builder mainly for uh, my friends' sites or uh, organizations that I was volunteering with. And it was only um, maybe two years ago that I started uh, doing freelancing uh, to build sites, bigger sites. Okay. That's quite interesting because my experience is, of, is that I started with a voluntary organization on a completely unpaid basis and had to build a website for them and just ended up um, using Drupal and have become more and more involved since, so that's um, quite interesting. Um, ah, I think it could be a it could be a very common beginning towards a lot of Drupal people. Yeah, I get the feeling that there are quite a few people that uh, start off on a voluntary basis because at our user groups in Hamburg, we also have quite a few people who do websites for um, um, sport. Uh, there's a guy who just does it for a sports organisation that's completely voluntary, and we've got someone who does uh, a website for his children's primary school, and um, it seems that there are quite a few people alongside the professional developers who uh, just build sites on a completely voluntary basis. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so, uh, um, how did the, because you organized the code sprint that took place last weekend, and that took place in around 30 cities, I think, and um, just mm -hmm. if you could give us uh, your impressions of, of how that went. Uh, well, I've gotten a lot of good feedback, and um, it didn't start out with 30 locations. It started out with uh, mine and then two more and uh, it, they trickled in uh, for a couple months but uh, Drupal people tend to organize events and sprints last minute so at the end it exploded with locations uh, which was uh, quite exciting and I think there were uh, locations uh, almost on every continent um, and Europe was really rocking it. They had the most by far. Cool. And we certainly had our sprint here in Hamburg despite the snow. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, it was really good and it was, um, for me it was my first sprint and um, I found it uh, really interesting to see how people were in their free time and on their weekends coming to help build the next generation of Drupal, and um, that's that really interesting. Yeah. 
My, when, um, my role in organizing the uh, Global Sprint Weekend was um, mostly, uh, from my perspective, is I wanted to support the local organizers. Uh, so there was a small platform to promote uh, the event, you know, calling it uh, a Drupal Global Sprint Weekend and uh, just telling people that it was happening and, hey, everybody else is doing one and you should do one and you should look for one that's local to you and uh, suggesting to people if they could not find one local to them that they should be empowered to... Um, start one, no matter how small. So if it was just them and a couple people at a cafe, that was totally cool. And if they found a uh, tech office to have a bigger sprint, that was also uh, a possibility. But I wanted to make sure that people who might be leading and organizing the sprint for the first time had the resources they needed to make their sprint successful. So. I wanted to give them links uh, that the community had had written for a while about how to plan a sprint, how to lead a sprint. I wanted to make sure they knew about those. And for people who wanted to uh, organize the tasks they had in mind to accomplish at their sprint, uh, we made the core office hours uh, infrastructure available to local sprint organizers, and so me and some of the other um, regular core mentors uh, met in IRC with local organizers to show them how to use the task organizational tools and uh, give them tips. So, so I was really wanting to support the local organizers so that when they were running their sprint, they felt like they were prepared and they knew what to do and they also knew who to reach out for help if they needed help during their sprint. Yeah, yeah I think you did a brilliant job there because uh, we've got a great uh, great number of people worldwide taking part and um, that was really, uh, it was really good to be able to feel that international community and um, we spoke to people in Australia while we were here and um, we uh, were looking at all the photos on the Twitter stream and stuff so uh, had a really good time. Yeah, it's um, something that didn't really occur to me until a couple days before the sprint. Since it, it was global, the weekend was a bit longer than a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, taking that into consideration. And uh, in terms of you know how many people participated and uh, what the effect is, we're still gathering statistics on that. So I'm hoping that people who went to a local sprint or organized one will um, do a write-up or, or tweet a little bit about how many people they had and what worked well for them. Yeah. So with the long weekend, you mean because of the time zones? Yeah, so Sydney was the first one to start on Saturday, which is my Friday night. Yeah. And uh, and then I think California was the last one to end, which was you know quite late on uh, on Sunday. So uh, so I was scrambling a bit uh, early Friday, going, oh my goodness, it doesn't start tomorrow; it starts today. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I know um, Webchick, uh, a committer for Drupal Eight. Uh, I know she was doing a lot of work the day before the sprint, also to try and clear some issues that were ready to be committed to get them in so that the sprints could be even more effective. So there was, um, there was definitely some planning in advance to make sure that uh, the weekend was the best that it could be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a long weekend because we, when we spoke to Adam Malone on the first day, he was just having a beer after his sprint in uh, Canberra and we were just getting started. And all the people in... Um, uh, in America, I hadn't even, uh, well, they're probably all in base. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, so on to the next question. Um, what um, applications would you say Drupal is especially suited for? And, um, so, so what uses and other particular industries that should be especially interested in Drupal? Mm. Well, my experience with 
building sites started out with uh, non-for-profits. And then when I started uh, building sites as a job, uh, it grew out of that area. And so it was still uh, related to that. And so I think there are a lot of big wins when you go for Drupal in terms of managing a large group of people who are going to be interacting and contributing content to a site. So providing uh, different levels of access and abilities to groups of users, uh, either because they are responsible for a certain section of a website, or they have a hierarchical um, approval system. Uh, so I think when you have a, a lot of people who need to get access to the internals, that Drupal uh, supports that really well. Yeah. Um, and then just one final question before I let you uh, get to bed, because it's very late where you are. Um, what's the most exciting thing about Drupal 8 from your perspective? Well, um, as a contributor to Drupal 8, my focus is multi uh, is on the multilingual uh, aspect, and so I had the experience of helping with uh, a training at a recent DrupalCon for doing a multilingual site in Drupal 7, and so I've seen how multilingual sites are built in Drupal 7, and uh, Drupal 8 is going to be a world of difference and a pleasure, I think, to build a multilingual site. Um, it's really going to be supported in core, and it's just uh, going to be totally brilliant. Uh, that's as a volunteer in terms of my contribution to Drupal 8. But what I'm really excited about in terms of like building sites and uh, being a site builder is the uh, configuration management stuff. I think it's going to um, be really critical for people uh, who are building sites to be able to manage their configuration in a sane way in terms of uh, pushing things live and making backups of their configuration. That's going to be something people are going to notice right what, away. What is the configuration management? What does that do? So in Drupal 7, uh, configuration settings, um, like uh, all the checkboxes that you do in the UI and while you're site building are stored in the database. And in Drupal 8, uh, the configuration management initiative uh, is doing a few things. But uh, I think one of the key things is uh, that those settings are stored in files in code. Mm -hmm. So they can be put under, uh, under revision control. So then you can use Git to be able to push and pull them to and, the, to and from the server. Um, That's right. Uh, so uh, if you have new settings for your configuration, you can work on them uh, locally or on your dev site and uh, commit them in Git and then uh, push them up through your servers and without having to uh, muck with the database. Okay. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like a really uh, useful, a really useful thing because that's uh, getting that separation between the database and the, and the code and the files. Right, and there's even support to do uh, diffs on the configuration. So uh, if the shop or the site builder sets uh, certain configuration settings and then on the live site the there are changes to the configuration setting, a site builder can come in and they can do a diff. Oh. And and see exactly uh, what the changes are, and then they can choose to revert or, you know, accept the new changes. Um, and there's a there's a UI for that actually to see the diff in the configuration. So that sounds really good. So that sounds like something um, I can get excited about as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that would be really useful. 
Good stuff. Then, um, well, I'm uh, finished with my questions now. And um, as I said, it's very late where you are. Uh, the day's just beginning where I am. So um, I'll uh, let you get off to bed. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking part, despite the uh, despite the fact that it's very late uh, where you are. And um, it's really good to meet you and to talk to you. Yes. No worries. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. See you soon. See you.